Hi, I'm Will from Venture to Rome. Have you ever made a really stupid modification to your rig? No, never? Well, coo 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 good for you. This video should make you feel very good about yourself then. Or maybe you just haven't made any modifications to your rig and you're looking to learn from the mistakes others have made. That's cool. Maybe you're just here to point and laugh. Look, those are all great reasons to watch this video because me and some of my overlanding YouTube friends got together and we decided to share with you some of our dumbest, stupidest, most idiotic modifications. Some are like, yeah, that was not a good idea. And some were like, you did what? Okay, this is actually a really good timing to tell you about my first stupid modification because I'm in the shop right now helping my best buddy install a new four and a half inch lift game changer suspension for Middle Cloak on his Jeep. And my first stupid modification that I wanna tell you about is a cheap budget bump stop lift that I put on my Jeep. What a bump stop lift is, it's like a body lift. So basically um, you put a puck <laughs> above the springs that lifts the body off the springs, but it's not longer springs, it's not longer shocks. There's no performance benefit that I can think of. And it truly felt like I was driving on stilts. Here's why this was such a stupid thing to have for me, because this is probably the most important modification you can make to your rig if you're gonna take it off road your suspension and your tires. So to put something into your rig that makes it look like it's lifted, but doesn't give a performance benefit, in fact, in some ways might decrease your performance, is not a good move at all. So do not go cheap on your suspension. It is critical. Do not go cheap on your tires. They are critical to having a good off-road experience. And it's something that I will never, ever, ever do again. So learn from my mistakes. Okay, next you're gonna hear from Nathan Muller, who has the overlanding channel, Nathan Muller Overlanding. And I'm actually in his shop right now. Nathan has been so kind to let us use this incredible shop with this beautiful lift to put uh, the suspension on Chris's rig. So Nathan has all kinds of videos on his channel that are informational videos about um, what, how to choose the right kind of gear, um, how to make the right kind of modifications to your rig to get the most out of your rig. He's a Toyota guy, so if you own a Toyota, he is an expert in like all things Toyota. And he's gonna tell you about the dumbest thing that he's ever done to his rig, which I love this one. Well, I'm not really proud of this one. When Will asked me if I would do a video on my worst mod, I knew exactly the thing that I should do, and I knew that I was gonna be embarrassed a little bit. So my name is Nathan Mueller, and on my channel, we test and teach and build and break a whole lot of gear and vehicles. So it is with no great pride that I have to admit that I once had a forerunner that had Nerf bars on it. Okay, now if you are never ever going to go off road, I totally understand Nerf bars for grandma or for your four year old to climb up into your truck. It makes total sense. But if you are doing an off road build or you are even building a truck that looks like it's built for off road, you should never do Nerf bars. And here's why. First off, Nerf bars hang down low. By nature, they are steps to get into your vehicle and the point of a step is for it to hang down low, which means it's killing your clearance. On top of that, these things cannot support the weight of your car. So if you ever are off-roading and you do catch these where the side of your car comes down on a rock in a hard place, they are not made to handle that. They will bend straight up into your car and many times they will actually cause significantly more damage than if your car had just hit that rock without Nerf bars because they have a tendency to bend up and roll into your doors and damage your doors so your doors won't close anymore. Okay, so the final thing, and look, I understand that we should not care what other people think about us and that is you don't wanna go live your whole entire life being worried about what everyone else thinks about you but the final thing about Nerf bars is when you have Nerf bars on a vehicle that looks like it is built to go off-roading, you just have to understand that you are advertising to the whole world of people that actually do know how to go off-roading that you don't know how to go off-roading. When I drive through a parking lot, you just go, Nerf bars, Nerf bars, Nerf bars. And it's just like, terrible build, terrible build. Should not have done that, bad decision. Nerf bars are no good for off-roading, and everyone knows it that knows it, and everyone that doesn't, doesn't. But 
We do. So don't have Nerf bars. You'll get picked on. Nobody likes to get picked on. Which leads me to my last point. Build a better truck. Don't get Nerf bars, get rock sliders. Rock sliders are incredible. Rock sliders are made of steel. They kind of look a little bit like Nerf bars. They usually are tucked up much higher and they are made to handle the full entire weight of your truck coming crashing down on them and still protecting your truck. So the beautiful thing about rock sliders is they actually increase the ability of your truck to go over crazy terrain. A lot of times where you wouldn't have clearance to get over a rock, a rock slider will simply just allow you to slide up on it and then slide down the other side. So it, it increases is your clearance by simply just allowing you to have a side pivot point to pivot over rocks and slide over rocks and slide down steps. Um, they're incredible. Uh, they should be one of the first three upgrades that you put on any vehicle that you plan to truly off-road. So don't get nerf bars like I did, and I'm still very embarrassed that I did. Get rock sliders. Much better tool. Right tool for the right job. Anyhow. That's what I've got, Nerf bars. Most embarrassing and worst mod I ever put on one of my vehicles. Oh, 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 um, wait one second, uh, one last point. You wanna know something really funny? Both Ford Raptors and most Broncos ship from the factory with Nerf bars on them, so. Thanks, Nathan. I can never drive into a parking lot again now. I'm just looking for Nerf bar, Nerf bar, Nerf bar, Nerf bar after watching your video, so thanks for ruining that for me. Um, this is the drop bracket I think we're gonna put on here to attach these control arms for Chris's suspension. So that's looking good. Thank you, Metal Cloak, for this. Um, the next person you're gonna hear from is Tyler from Independence Overland. Now, Independence Overland is based out of Colorado. Tyler is an excellent filmmaker. He makes some really, really good videos and goes some really interesting places, Mexico, Arizona, obviously Colorado, so some really good content over there. And he's gonna tell you about the most troublesome modification he's made to his Toyota FJ Cruiser. Hey guys, Tyler with Independence Overland. So today we are talking about the worst modifications that we've done to our four wheel drives. Now Will reached out to me on this and I really had to give it some thought because there's two things that I think are the worst that I've done to this FJ. And it was a toss up between a CB radio, and I can get into that some other time, or my sway bar disconnects. And ultimately, I decided the sway bar disconnects have cost me the most money, and so that's what we're gonna go with. Toyotas don't have a good option for a disconnect, so different companies have come up with different ideas, and all of the things that I've tried so far have just led to CV axles just going out, boots get torn up, and now you're stuck in a situation where you either have to rebuild that boot when you get home, or if you're on a trip, it's gonna cause major problems because you're gonna get sand inside of the CV and ultimately destroy it down the line. So this takes place of your sway bar end link. And the idea behind it is that you have a fixed sway bar link, but whenever you pull this pin, now your sway bar can move up and down as it needs to. It's good in principle, but it doesn't hold up. So you'll see these posted in various forums on how to build them for yourself, or you can buy them from different manufacturers. And it seems like a very good idea, but for overland travel, it's a poor thing because you're gonna run into axle issues down the road, no matter how good you keep your hardware or how much Loctite is on these things. What I thought the first few times is maybe this was a user error and I just didn't put enough Loctite on, I didn't torque them down correctly, something like that. And uh, I double checked that multiple times on multiple sets and now I've bought $1,500 in axles. And so all you Toyota guys out there, avoid these at all costs. There is a new product coming to market that is a similar design, but it doesn't have the failure points or the possibility to have the failure points that this does. So if you wanna check that out over at Independence Overland, I will be reviewing those soon. Thank you, Will, for including me in this. And if you guys wanna watch me beat the tar out of this FJ, come on over to Independence Overland. I've got all sorts of off-road adventure and overland related content. The sway bar connectors, that's so funny because that's one of the first modifications I bought for my Jeep Wrangler Sahara was the JKS quicker disconnect sway bar connectors because this, the Saharas do not have the push button sway bar disconnects that the Rubicons have. And those JKS uh, discos have been amazing. They have held up for five plus years, thousands of off-road miles. I take them off all the time. So it's interesting how that was a really solid modification for me and my Jeep, but that's a failure point for Tyler and his FJ. So next you're gonna hear from Fletch over at All Things Overlanding. And Fletch is like one of my oldest internet creator friends. We've been sharing content for a long, long time. He has a great channel. He does gear reviews, he does trip videos, and he has a great podcast. 
and it all centers around Nissan. So I try not to judge him for being a Nissan guy, like he try, tries not to judge me for being a Wrangler guy. Um, and uh, he's gonna tell you about a couple mods that he made to his Nissan that are very interesting and cautionary tales. Fletcher Mall Things Overlanding here, and today I'm excited to be working with these other YouTubers to talk about the worst mods that we've ever done to our vehicles. I'm a Nissan guy. I have a Titan Swap Nissan Frontier, meaning that it's got all Nissan Titan full-size truck suspension, axles, components, and stuff underneath of it, but I have made some really bad mistakes in modifying this thing. There are a couple things that I would do differently if I was to do it again, and even modifications that I really hate and I wish I hadn't done. Uh, the first of which is my headlights. So when I bought the truck, it had about 205,000 miles on it and it had the OEM headlights and they were sandblasted. So they were basically like just orange and faded uh, and, and terrible, right? But they were the OEM ones. They were still okay from a brightness standpoint. But so I decided that I wanted to get like blacked out housings and make it look a little bit cooler. And I do like how the truck looks with these headlights, but the reflectors in these things, they were about $150 for this set of lights. They were very inexpensive. They are terrible. So like, I mean like dangerously bad. When I'm driving at night or especially in the rain at night, I almost have to turn on all my auxiliary lights because I can't see a thing. So lighting is really important and going cheap on it or you know just going with something that's cool looking but doesn't actually work very well is not always the best option. The next thing that I will say is actually not a modification that I dislike but the way that I mounted it is my problem. You'll notice my five pound propane tank mounted out here on the outside of my bed rack. I love the mount. It's built by a really awesome small company, uh, 63 Designs, and it's a great mount. There's nothing wrong with it. but. I, for some reason, because it was a little bit easier to mount and because it gave me all the room inside of the bed rack, I mounted it to the outside of the bed rack. And as you can see, it sticks out quite a bit. So if I'm driving through any sort of mud or rocks, every single thing is caking up on it, snow, ice, uh, salt from the roads, everything is caking on my five pound propane tank. It's just getting disgusting and dirty all the time, caked full of mud and grit. Uh, so it's not ideal. And also then it kind of rubs on trees and stuff like that. If you're on a tight trail, you got to kind of watch it. So definitely when I reconfigure my, my bed rack, that is moving to the inside of the bed rack. And that was not a smart decision. And then the third thing that I would say is kind of a hit or miss mod. I'm currently happy with my head unit that I've got. I went to a 10.1 inch, one of the, the sort of Chinese brand 10.1 uh, inch touchscreen units because I thought, oh, I'm going to do Gaia on this thing and I'm going to download maps and I'm going to use the app store. And I'm going to use all these different things, right? And what actually ended up happening is that because it's a very inexpensive head unit, at least on my old truck, it was like sort of the bottom of the barrel, slowest, you know, lowest RAM model that you could get. It froze all the time, constantly. So if I was going on a long trip, I might get two hours into a 10 hour drive and not have any music, not have any maps, not have any CarPlay, anything like that, and just be in silence. So if I had that to do again, I'd probably just spend a little bit more money and get a name brand head unit with a touch screen and everything so that I didn't have to keep messing with either replacing it or, you know, the problems come with a cheaper head unit. Um, so as you kind of noticed, uh, the theme of this is buying really crappy cheap stuff, right? That's kind of always been my problem. My channel is mostly about budget-minded stuff, but also some of the stuff I've learned as far as like where it's better to spend more money and, and where it's okay to save some money. So that's a lot of the content that you'll find on my channel. So if you want to come hang out, I'd love to have you. Um, but I hope that this was helpful for you, and I know the rest of these guys are going to give you some awesome tips on what not to do. So thanks again, Will, for having me. Thanks, everybody, for letting me be a part of the collaboration and hope to see you guys over on my channel. Thanks, Fletch. <clears throat> that head unit is a cautionary tale, but I like the bracket for the tank. It's just installed in kind of a funny place, <laughs> but no judgment. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Mike over at Flyfisher 530. Now, Mike has a great YouTube channel. He does epic adventures. He's based out of uh, the Tahoe area in California, so Northern California, and he's just also a really nice human being. So he has something that I bet a lot of people watching this video have also done, so check it out. Hi everyone, my name's Mike, also known as Flyfisher530. Uh, my worst mod on my Jeep, uh, which may be debatable to some people, is my rock lights. They're the typical kind that were the red, green, blue style of lights that uh, can shift colors. Um, for me, that wasn't why I got them. Um, the intention was to have, uh, you know, light on the ground around my Jeep so it provides some illumination not to trip over stuff that might be on the ground. These don't do that for me. So the last two years that I've had these rock lights, I rarely if ever have turned the switch on. In fact, my awning lights that I installed on my Allocab awning provide much more illumination around the campsite than those rock lights ever will. 
And if you're interested in that, I do have a video on my channel that you can check out. The good side of what they do is I, I decided to install them inside the wheel well of my Jeep. And uh, I'm not sure if that was the smartest thing to do. I knew there was a good potential for rocks to fly around and hit the, uh, the lights themselves. They are exposed to that kind of issue. But I also installed two in the engine bay. And those two, I think, probably out of all of them will be the most useful, hopefully at some point down the road. The worst thing I think I did was the way I installed them, which was to um, bring all the lights into the engine bay area. And so I've ended up in my engine bay with this nesting of wires uh, sitting uh, right in the front of my engine bay and then the, the control unit uh, sits right over my fuse box. It just, it looks terrible in the engine bay, first of all, to have all these wires uh, all over the place. And uh, the second thing is just the lack of illumination that they provide on the ground. So hopefully that uh, gives you guys my insight as to what I think uh, the worst mod on my Jeep is. Oh yeah, rock lights. Rock lights are one of those mods that like, they sound like such a good idea. I've thought of it many times and for whatever reason, I just haven't done it yet, but yeah, I think it's a really easy mistake to make if you don't get good ones or if you don't put them in a place that will actually give you some level of benefit. So thanks for sharing that, Mike. Next, you're gonna hear from Caleb over at Baker Overland. Now, Caleb's based in Arkansas and he's probably the best storyteller of any YouTube channel that's out there. He's just gifted when it comes to writing and narrating. He's somebody, when I watch his stuff, I'm like, ooh, I need to do better. So I can't wait for you to meet Caleb over at um, Baker Overland. And he's got something that was a really good idea, a really good product, but just done kind of in a maybe not so practical way. What's up guys, Caleb with Baker Overland here, and we're talking worst mods that we've done on the truck. I've had a couple doozies, but this one is definitely the top of the list. So a lot of guys use traction boards and they can help you get out or when you get stuck and it makes a lot of sense to have those. So I mounted mine on the inside of my bed rack. Further, I was paranoid when I started doing my build a couple years ago and I used to have locks on everything. And I've actually got the locks on the Rotopack mounts on this. So these locks do really good with regular maintenance. If you go in dusty areas and you, you know, you're constantly keeping them lubricated, going in and checking on them, they do great. But I am terrible with that. So the roto packs on the outside of the truck, uh, I solved the problem by just getting rid of the locks. I actually had to take a hacksaw to one because I couldn't use the key. I haven't taken the hacksaw to these. They are gummed up like the outside ones. So first of all, I can't get to the traction boards with the locks on. Need to get those set off. Even when I saw them off though, they're mounted on the inside of my bed rack. So if any of you guys have a truck and you camp, you know, we typically have lots of gear back here. In Arkansas, usually when we get stuck, it's in mud or water and the back of the truck is almost always submerged. So the issue that I've got is can't get in here to access it. So I use my winch 99% of the time when I get stuck, when I could use traction boards to get out um, without having to go, you know, to the winch. But because I'm an idiot and mounted them in here, uh, they, they do nothing but, you know, look cool. So the plan is saw those locks off, pull them out, move into the exterior. You know, for stuff like recovery, put it on your roof, put it in a place that's easily accessible, trash in your cab, but don't put it somewhere that, that's gonna be difficult to get to, you know, when you're in a situation where you need it. So Will, that's my worst mod. Thanks for having me on the collab. It's been fun. Hey, Caleb, don't feel too bad, man. I've done a bunch of dumb stuff too, so you're in good company, and thank you for making that video. Next, we're gonna hear from Mike over at the Unexpected Off-Road. Now, Mike is based out of BC, and he drives a Hummer, and he's gonna share with you not so much a dumb modification as it is, uh, let's just say, a way of life. Hello, my name is Mike from the Unexpected Off-Road. And yes, I've had a few overlanding mods or just turned out to be bad ideas that just did not work out. So mine is kind of simple. And if you're new to overlanding, take a listen to this. This, this may help you out. So I'm an off-road guy that goes out on weekend trips and occasionally on three to four day trips, maybe here and there. So I've always used coolers just like this. So going on longer overlanding trips was kind of a new thing for me. So. Normally, I would just take one of these coolers and act exactly what I did on this trip, and I packed full ice, two blocks of ice, um, packed my drinks, and then packed some more ice, and then packed my heat and eat food. So, you know, just the pre-prepared food that you just heat up on, you know, a stove, cook stove. So anyways, um, thought that would be great. So 
went on my trip and didn't even think about the ice and seemed like it was fine for the first like two days seemed great everything was ice cold and whatnot so after about the third day um we had a long day of the trail we were driving off road and uh bumping around in the roads you know and stuff like that the trails are rough didn't even think about it so when i get to the trail i open up my food and everything that i thought was perfectly sealed up leaked water and it leaked water in in and out of the food so then yeah, I ended up with meat water, and that was terrible. It was so gross, and just like, it ruined my meal for that night. So then, the next day, of course, you gotta feed the thing ice, because that's what he uses, is ice. So, at our fuel stop, I stopped and poured out all the meat water, or washed out the meat water the best I could, and then I uh, refilled it with ice again, put my drinks back in, and went on the way. And ate hot dogs the rest of the trip because I didn't have anything to seal it up. Yes, I know I could have had a, a, a rack system in here to um, keep the meat and food away from the ice and the water, and I could have probably maybe sealed it up better. But what I'm getting at is, from my own experience, if I just would have bought a 12 volt cooler, just a simple cheap 12 volt cooler that I could have threw my food in and just never had this problem from the beginning. And that's kind of my, that's kind of my thing to you is yes a 12 volt cooler is definitely worth it and i'm still using an ice cooler and soon hopefully i will upgrade one day to a 12 volt cooler that'll be just down the road for me but yeah that's my uh that's my overlanding mod that kind of was a failure for me and uh i didn't realize it just because i didn't have the experience and i'm just trying to pass experience on to new people that may not know the same thing that i do learn from my learn from my mistakes because trust me Nobody likes meat water. Nobody. That's just gross. So just don't do the same thing that I did. Thanks. Well, there you have it. Just because you have a YouTube channel and you go off road a lot does not mean that you don't do really stupid things sometimes. So I hope that you learned something from our mistakes or at least had fun watching us share our mistakes with you. Do go check out those channels. They're all really amazing creators and they're definitely worth your time to go watch and subscribe to. Until next time, I'm Will from Nurture to Rome. Thanks for watching.